Yeah, yeah. All right. So here we are, a little technical difficulty, but we're back on the Do Big Things podcast. I'm with my man, TJ Pitts. And uh, we are here having a conversation today because he just completed a big adventure. Uh, it was a southbound, self-supported FKT on the Benton McKay Trail. Uh, that's a 300-mile trail of the most remote and beautiful backcountry of North Carolina, Tennessee, and Georgia. My man did it in five days, 18 hours, and 42 minutes. TJ, how, how did you do it? <laughs> man, it's just day in, day out grind, you know? <laughs> really? Um, and you, yeah, that's really what, you know, I mean, it's like anything else. It's just you... <laughs> You just got to put in the work, and yeah. there's a lot of work to be put in. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, and it, and that's my that's my second time trying it. Oh, okay. So, okay. yeah, yeah. So I have uh, failed once in the past back in 2018. Okay. And so that was uh, ago. yeah, that was a horrific failure. <laughs> really? So, okay. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. Well, why do you say that? Yeah. So, well, it was one of the kind of situations where I started, I was doing this one, that attempt fully supported. Okay. So you start scheduling everybody to help you, you know, you've mm. got five, six different people, they're, they're mm. tweaking work schedules, they're, uh, mm. you know, everything else, right? So you finally get this window, everybody's set up, and then there was a hurricane coming through, <laughs> and... <laughs> And I'm like, so then I'm sitting there, I'm like, okay, well, do I take a crack at it or do I wait to the fall? Uh, and I already had so many people schedule schedules kind of wrapped around it that maybe it was ego and pride too, but I was like, you know what? I'm going for it. Yes. Oh my God. And it was like, I mean, there was so much rain that, I mean, there was parts of the trail where the river was swollen over and it was like way steep and I was hiking through it. <laughs> There was, uh, there was, tr I mean, it was the the ground was so saturated, trees were falling across service roads, so my crew couldn't get to me anyways. <laughs> and it, uh, I mean, it rained nonstop, man. I, I think, uh, I think I had, pe I swear, for the next year after that attempt, when it rained, I would lay in my bed and it was like I would have flashbacks to the BMT, and I'm like, uh -uh. I, I swear, I had PTSD from the, from that trail <laughs> and from that attempt, uh -huh. and uh, so I just suffered and suffered, and I. It, Oh man, I made a, I basically on the third day made a wrong turn, like a navigational error. Mm. It was, and essentially there's a, there's a new high water reroute that is now the official way the trail goes. The Nat Geo maps don't show it that way. They show it the way the existing trail used to go mm. down into an area where there could be a high water issue, right? Okay. So I didn't realize I had tweaked over the last few years. So I took that route and it hadn't been maintained in, I don't know, two, three, four years. So I hit 23 miles of just briars and blowdowns. And mm. I think it took me nine hours to go through <laughs> the first 23 miles of, uh, of day three. I mean, it was so <laughs> slow going. I was getting, like, I was getting in the creek and hiking up the creek because it was faster than the trail next to it. Mm. So so uh, so i make it about 100 yes yeah, so i make it about 150 in just marching through briars for almost 50 miles that day and i'm like i'm done i was i was so wrecked that i was like okay i'm done well i slept maybe an hour at the 150 mile mark and i got up and my crew started making me pancakes i'm like i right, whatever i guess i'll get back on the trail so eat pancakes jump back on the trail put in another 40 or 50 and then basically my body just started shutting down on me. It's just like I had pushed it so much and slept so little that I, I don't know. I started having these weird bouts of just getting really hot and really weak to the point where I would hike like five foot and like take a knee, hike five foot, take a knee. And I was, I, you know, I, I was just wrecked. Mm -hmm. So basically I made it nearly 200 miles the first time. And then that just, that trashed me. It wrecked my body for, pro no, I mean, I mean, maybe a year and a half. Really? It, yeah, probably a year and a half, man. So I just like, constantly, yeah. Just, how? It, it was, I don't, I don't know exactly what it did. I don't know if it's your endocrine system, your adrenals. I don't know if it's your, exactly what it affected. But I mean, I, I did blood work. I did hair analysis. I did all mm -hmm. kinds of stuff trying to figure out how to get out of this like constant state of fatigue. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it was just constantly always had a bunch of little injuries that kept popping up, but then I could never, 
uh, it's like I'd go run five or six miles and it would almost like need to come home and take a nap, you know, and I was, and I was, it just took me forever to get past whatever I did to my body during okay. the first attempt. Wow. Yeah. So that was, that, did you ever you figure know, that, it out? Like exactly what was wrong? Uh, you know, what I ended up doing that finally got me out of it. I did this hair test analysis and they, they, uh, they take your hair and it looks back basically eight weeks and it shows any sort of uh, heavy metals, any sort of uh, micronutrient deficiencies, like it shows the balance, like in like the hair follicle will show what your body's been doing basically the last eight, eight weeks. Mm. So it could, act, so it actually looks at a balance of the different uh, nutrients, like, you know, cause there's, I guess the balance is more important than, you know, like maybe like balance between, I think it was like vitamin D and calcium and iron and, and, and different things, how they work together. Mm -hmm. So I looked at, looked at all that and then they, Basically, I made a got a custom supplement made for me for like four months, and oh. I took them supplements and took a and did the diet that they suggested, and then I started training more off heart rate because I think I was just always, I mean, I, my my easy runs like I think I would always just have my heart what heart rate way too high. Okay, so I kind of you know so I kind of got into the heart rate thing and then started supplementing that and that and that slowly brought me out of it. Wow, probably yeah. So it was probably like you know it was a good year probably after the first attempt wow. so yeah so it was just so. so you really had to earn this thing huh <laughs> oh man yeah dude wow. for sure yeah so wow. for sure so so I literally the the first four or five months of good training that i put in as soon as i had about four months under my belt i was like uh all right back to the you know back to north carolina we're going back going back okay. to get this thing done nice yeah wow. so wow well yes, i can sir. totally relate to uh you know what that's like do you work a full-time job yes sir yeah so if you're working a full-time job you got to take this vacation time off and if you if you have crew coming out to support you they're taking vacation time off you know you set this date i've done the same i've been in the exact same shoes you set a date this is right. the weekend i'm going to go out and i'm going to do this thing and it just happens mm -hmm. to be the weekend of uh you know a tsunami basically like i've had this happen on nolan's attempts mm -hmm. and uh it's like, well, everyone's taken off. We're all here. This is the weekend we said, I don't have vacation time next week. You know, like this is it right here. Right. And so then you just right. decide, well, I'm going to go for it, you know, and then you start and it's mm -hmm. just a complete disaster. And it's just, so I can totally relate. So it's, yep. it yep. sucks, man. It sucks. But you know, yeah. I mean, that's part of it when you work full time and it, especially if you have crew. So is that part of the reason you decided to go self-supported? Yeah, that, that was definitely uh, one of the reasons. Okay. That, so that was one of the big reasons. And then, I, I don't know, over the last couple of years, I had also started thinking about, I, I started envisioning it to where I was doing it self-supported. And I don't know, that, that, that seemed to motivate me more. Like, I just had a different element to it, a different twist. I'm like, you, you know, and, you're, and you know it's going to, it's already hard enough. Right. And I, like, I know that's going to ratchet it up and I'm not a, I'm not a through hiker. I'm not a, I'm not a fast pack guy. Mm. Um, like I don't have that background. Right. True. So I, I was thinking about doing it that way and I thought about it more and more and more. And then, uh, so I moved out to Colorado back in June okay. and I'm over on. Yeah. So, so when I get out there, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to start. I, I'll tell you honestly. So I was listening to the FKT podcast with uh, Buzz and uh, String Bean. Mm. And I followed String Bean just because, I, just because you know, the stuff he's done self-supported and unsupported is nuts. Like if you look at his, if you, I mean, when he went and did the AT speed record and he knocked off Carl Meltzer and, and, and Scott Jerick, who had a full crew the whole time, and he just did it self-supported. I'm like, okay, what? Like, what's this dude about? Like, how is he? So I started looking into, like, how he was running and training and fueling. And he, I'm telling you, man, if you start looking at them guys, like them, them fast through hike guys, them are some of the hardest dudes out there. Mm. Like, if you really compare how they cover mileage and how they're doing it compared to, like, ultra races, man, we're super pampered over here, you <laughs> know? <laughs> and, it, it, and you know, like, it's the funniest thing now because you'll see people like, oh, the eight station's nine miles or 10 miles, and it's only going to be water, and they don't have vegan whatever, and it's like, <laughs> it's super pampered, you know? And, like, you see For these sure. guys, and they're just 
sleeping in the dirt, covering 50, mm-hmm. 52 miles a day, eating whatever they can eat. And it's just day after day after day. And these guys are just self-reliant. They just grind. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, well, if I want to go self-supported, then I got to start trying to learn from them guys and their mentality. Mm-hmm. So as soon as I moved out to Colorado, man, I started, uh, I started looking at his website, checking all his stuff out. Um, you know, I ran into Joey. I met, that's where I met Joey Campanelli. He's, you know, he's a, he's a character, right? So, oh, man. so I'm out, right? So, <laughs> so I'm at, so I'm out west, right? And then Sarah's kind of so Sarah Hansel, she's kind of in the same predicament as far as like always trying to schedule crew around, putting her out. And I've helped her out multiple times on Nolan's, okay. And uh, and seen how much of a how much of a headache it is. So when she was like, you know what, I'm gonna go and support it. I was like, oh, okay. But I watched her do it, and I watched her make like the transition. And then after Joey crushed Nolan's, we went and hiked uh, Holy Cross with him. You know, he's got a uh, he's got a self supported uh, AT speed hike record too. I saw that a lot of people. Yeah, that a lot of people don't realize. So I was just picking his brain the entire hike. Yeah. You know, what, what, what do you do about, you know, pulling water, your calories, your this and that. Like, you know, so I kept picking his brain and uh, mm-hmm. and just learning everything I could learn from all them guys. I mean, I used to, right. you know, there's a group of killers out there in Colorado, man. Oh, I just yeah. happened to rub shoulders with a few of them, you know. Cool. And I'm always just asking questions and picking their brain. Cool. Um, Cool. Yeah, and, you know Andrea, you know Andrea and Andrew Hamilton and cats. They go hiking with and go running mm-hmm. with, like mm-hmm. you know what I mean. Like there's just a wealth of knowledge, wealth of knowledge, and then guys. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm always asking questions the entire hike. They probably get tired of me asking questions. I mean, I'm asking <laughs> questions when we're driving to the trailhead or climbing a 14 or descending. I'm asking. You know, so what were some of the key so, takeaways that you took from some of those guys? Like, like you said, you're asking all these questions or is there like one or two takeaways that were just like game changers for you that like really opened your eyes to this, this world of self-supported? I, man, I think it's just how efficient they are. Like their, like their economy of, of motion is so efficient. Like even watching Joey trash after Nolan's doing Holy Cross, just watching the way he's going up the mountain and grabbing water and the way he's pulling stuff in and out of his pack, but never quits moving. Like if you watch these guys, like they're just, and Sarah's the same way at aid stations. Like if you watch, like Sarah will run right through aid stations and maybe not even touch it because she just knows she's fine for another 10 miles. Mm. And like you start seeing like, I mean, minutes equal hours, hours equal days. Like, I mean, it all adds up and it's just, if you, and you know how it goes. Like if you look at your GPS data after an ultra race, you'll see your moving time compared to your stop time. And you're like, how did I eat up that much time in aid stations? Mm-hmm. Like, was I really sitting in a chair for 12 minutes, like yeah. doing this and that, you know, like, mm-hmm. so like, I think it's really just how efficient they are mm-hmm. in, in everything they do. Like they're wow. not, there's no just like sitting around taking a 10 minute break with them guys. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? They're, they're on it. Yeah. So it was, it was, I think that was the main takeaway. And it's just, I mean, and then obviously, you, you, you know, they're just gritty. I mean, they're just, mm-hmm. when you talk about like true grit, like them guys are, all of them are gritty. Yeah. Hamilton, all of them, mm-hmm. Campanelli, Stringby, all of them. I mean, mm-hmm. it just, there's no, uh, the mental fortitude of them guys, man, it's so impressive to me, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's yeah. just, yeah. So wow. that, I would say that's probably the main thing, just the efficiency. Okay. And there, And there's no, and they don't, there's no like, with them, there's no like, oh, well, I'll have a crew meet me and we'll drive down the hill and get in a hotel room and this and that. Like, like the first time I attempted it, it's like I set it up like I was, uh, like I was fast enough to be doing the stuff I was doing. Like, I, like when I finished my day one last time, I drove 15 minutes down to Bryson City and slept in a in a hotel, oh. and then 15 minutes back up. Right, so it's like there's 30 minutes of drive time. And then it's like, then if you meet your crew here and eat something hot, there's 10 minutes. Then there's another 20 minutes here or there. Like it, and I was like, and I was sitting there thinking, I was like, I'm not fast enough to, right. to have these luxuries. Like I don't, I can't be just wasting 30 minutes here and there. Like I gotta, like if I'm going to do it and pull it off, that was another thing with the self-supported. I was like, it just streamlines it. When you get to the end of the day, you're eating, sleeping in the dirt and you're taking off again, mm. which is what I would have to do with, with my ability. I'm, I'm not a, you know, I'm not some fast collegiate guy by any means. Yeah. So wow. I just, yeah. So I, I knew, and I mean, the dude who had the record is, a, is a, like, a, I mean, he's an East coast legend. I mean, the dude, yeah. Matt Kirk, who had the overall record. I mean, I, 
he's and he's right there. He's cut from the same cloth as like Joey and String really? B and all them. Okay. I mean, this guy's. A, I mean, he had the AT speed record at one time, the Mountain to Sea Trail record. Hell, he might still have some of them. Wow. The Mountain to Sea Trail, the, the six thousand, uh, the six thousand foot peak record, which is like it's nearly a three hundred mile line on the East Coast. And he and he like got that. You know, he took that record from Cave Dogs. So like the dude. So the, so the dude was, you know, the dude who had the record, I was like, well, this guy doesn't play either. And he mm. went self-supported. Mm. And, I mean, this guy's just on it. He's super efficient, too. Like I said, he's cut from that same cloth. So I'm like, I, I, I'm not faster or more talented than him by any means. I was like, but I think I can grind a little bit longer every day and sleep a little bit less. And I think I can knock it off by a few hours if I don't just completely self-destruct out there. Mm. Was basically my mentality. Wow. That's yeah. impressive, man. I mean, where does that grind come from with, with you? I mean, like, I, I know you've done some hundred milers, but like, what's your history with ultra running? And then, you know, this is, it sounds like it was a little bit more of a fast pack, but um, like, how did you come up in this game? Yeah. So, I mean, I did the normal, just, you know, I, you know, so I guess, I get when I was younger, so I grew up like dad, dad's ex Marine. So I grew up always seeing him out running, doing mm. his thing. And so when I was 13, 14, 15, he started dragging me along on four or five mile runs mm. and did a little running with him when I was younger, you know. And, you know, it's like that drill instructor type, like mm. running, you know what yep. I mean? Yep. So, yeah, yeah. So, so I had that. And then I got, you know, and then I did the whole get out of high school, college, partying, wilding out, mm -hmm. you know, go down that road. Finally, when I was like 21, 22, I came back to like, okay, I need to get back in shape. And I started lifting weights, running a little bit. Then you know how it goes. So I was like, I did a couple half marathons on the road. And then uh, there was like a trail uh, 50K. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh man, that looks, to me, it seems, you know what I mean? It was a trail 50K and I was like, all right, that's the next goal. And it's uh was on some local trails that I run a good bit on. So I trained for that. Ram a fifty ran my first fifty K and then it was kinda, you know, okay, here's another fifty K. And then my buddy's like, Hey, let's go run this fifty mile or then let's you know, and then and then it's like, okay, I gotta get a buckle. So it, it, it was like that slow progression of uh, you know, fifty Ks, fifty milers, and then I uh, started going out west and running some uh uh some like west coast hundred mile races. And uh, just slowly just kind of built the base from there. Sure. Probably over the last, I don't know, maybe, what was that, maybe seven years ago? Maybe okay. somewhere around that time frame I started okay. running them, yeah. Okay. And I'm so, curious, so, like, and I think I took a peek at your ultra sign up, but I don't remember, how many hundred milers have you done? I know you've done a handful of them. You know, I think I've, I think I've got four or five on there. Okay. I think, yeah, four or five. High, Lon High Lonesome was one of them? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep, yep. I've done that so, one. So you've done a couple of the big cool. mountain races. Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, I think Tahoe 100 was my first one. Oh, nice. And then uh, and then I went and did the Bear 2016 oh. in the mud, which was a <laughs> which was a absolute gut check. <laughs> that was the race I was referring to that I was more destroyed after that race than I was the 300 miles because of the mud. Wow. I just, boy, it, <laughs> oh, man, bad, bad memories about that one. But that was <laughs> – it's like it's your second it's your second hundred mile race and it's just nothing but mud and each foot weighs eight nine or you know eight nine ten pounds by mile 30 my hip flexors are just shot from picking up my legs because my feet are so heavy with all the mud caked up on them and i'm like man this is gonna be a horrible 70 miles to get to the finish but it's like you know what it was it was like you know you signed up for it you yeah. knew the weather was coming in yeah. gut check yeah. yeah, gut check. You want the buckle or not? So like, nice. got that one done, and then, cool. uh, so I was like, so and then I was like, I got to go back and run that one in good weather. So the following year, I actually trained and did I think uh, high lonesome, and then it was either six weeks or eight weeks later, I went back and ran the bear again nice. for a second time in good weather, and actually was able to yeah run an okay time at it, yeah. but. Yeah. I feel like, you know how it is with a 100 mile race. I feel like I still haven't ever had like a good start to finish day from the jump to the end. Sure. For the most part, it's been like horrific 20, 30 mile sections and then like, you know, and then just <laughs> gut it out for another 20 or third or so. You know what I mean? Like, I haven't had like a good 100 mile day yet, I feel like. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> you got to, you got to expect that stuff to be, to pop up in 100 mile. The distance is so long and, and I mean, so this last event you did, I mean, you're out there for five days, you know, I mean, yeah. 
<laughs> have you ever done anything? Be, I mean, you've done hundred milers, which are about a day, you know, have you done anything right. between a hundred mile and in a five day event? The only thing was the failed four day, 200 miler that I did in 2018 on the same trail. Okay. So that's okay. the only thing. Now I've done, I've done like longer, like three, four day, like kind of like fast pack stuff, like on the hard rock course. Mm. Like, I, I think that's like one of the best, I think it's like one of the best three or four day training things you can do. Go do the hard rock course over three or four days, oh. four weeks out from an event. Oh. And so I did that. Bef- yeah. So I did that before high lonesome in 2017. Mm-hmm. That really helped me out with the elevation and, and, uh, and the, the climbing and descending. And, uh, so it's not, I mean, I get what you're saying. It's, it's not the same thing, but it was still like, you know, you, I still had three, four days in a row where it's like 13, 14, 15 hour days, just slow grinds. And then I did, so I did, uh, I did like 80 something miles of the hard rock course four weeks before I did this. And I didn't do the short day from Uray to Telluride because there was that bad weather. It was that, that weekend, I think it was Labor Day weekend when the snow came in. Oh, yeah. So I had to, so I had to bail on that last day to get back, to get back home. But anyways, I did a, a real tough three day uh, three days out there, probably had on like a 15, 16, 17 pound pack, had it loaded with everything, added all the weight. And it was just three days of just grinding, grinding. at, you know, I mean, the hard rock, you know, how the, I mean, hard rock course is, mm-hmm. it's nasty, you know? Yep. So, so I've done stuff like that, trying to prep for it. I've done longer back to back, uh, a lot of back to back to back or back to back runs on the weekends out there mm-hmm. on just different tough stuff but as far as events getting up over the 100 mile distance I, yeah the most experience i had with that was well felling in 2018 on the bmt but i learned so much from that that i, I definitely applied a lot of what i what i learned in 2018 to to make this attempt you know right. successful For sure. so yes sir that's pretty interesting. Like when I was talking to Sarah Hansel, she kind of said the same thing before she did Nolan's. She went out and did like a three day scouting mission where she did the whole complete line. And I think it was like three days, uh, maybe a month mm-hmm. or two before her actual event. Mm-hmm. Um, have you heard of other people doing that? Like, I haven't heard of a lot of people talking about that until recently, I guess. I mean, it's a great idea. Uh, I should, yeah. maybe, I should employ something like that. It, I tell you, man, it, I mean, I, th- I mean, you probably should have, especially you're, you live in Colorado, right? I do. I'm in Boulder. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. So I, yeah, I mean, I think so. And especially for, I, I think something that's set up like a Nolan's route or like a BMT long day multi route, like, it, I mean, like, you know, the brunt of your mileage is going to be, I'm going to be wearing probably a 10, 12 pound pack. And I'm going to be doing a combination of, of hiking mountains and running the descents and running the flats. And I'm, I'm doing this like back and forth, like hike run. Right. You know, so, you know, to, to, yeah, I, I think the, the back to back to back, just long days where you're just getting used to figuring out what kind of fuel you can eat, how many calories you're eating, what you can stomach. And you're just getting used to them long grinding days. I think it's more of a, I don't even know that it's so much of a physical try. I mean, obviously you're gaining physical, you know, you're getting physical strengths from doing that, but I think it's more of like a mental mm-hmm. adaptation. It's like, mm-hmm. there's like, for me, there's something that like over that four or five, six months of training that I've always noticed. It's more that I'm like, it, it's more that my mind, I'm more trained to mind the way like it processes time or something. So like, if I'm doing these long back to back to back, it's just like your mind gets used to just being out there grinding and grinding mm-hmm. and grinding, you know, like, and if you're only, if you're only used to doing four or five, six hour runs, mm-hmm. it, there's just a big difference in doing a four or five, six hour training run and doing a 60 hour push on Nolan's or doing okay. a six day push on the BMT. Right. Like, and yep. it's just like, I don't like, for me, I feel like it's training the mind yeah. and it gets to the point, like, as I go through a training block that, you know, I, I, at first when I'm doing the five hour run or something, like it'll feel like, oh man, it feels like I've been out here for five hours. And then we get to the point where I'm like, yeah, I feel like I've been running an hour or two. And then I'll look at my watch and six hours or seven hours is done past. And it's just like, and I, I noticed the same thing when I did the, uh, when I did the hard rock course over four days, getting ready for high lonesome back in 2017, I was, my body and mind were just so used to doing long grinding days in the mountains. By the time the race rolled around, 
you know, I'm 60, 70 miles into the race and whatever, 20 hours into it. And I'm just like, it's just another day out in the mountains. Another sun's day. coming up. Yeah. And I'm just like, Hey, sun's coming up and I'm making a final push to the finish line right now. And I'm good to go. And it was just, I don't know. It's just like a, it was like a mental thing. And mm-hmm. then of course, obviously you're, I mean, you're just at a low heart rate the whole time too. So your body's probably just getting more efficient at that lower heart rate and more efficient at taking in fuel and the legs are getting stronger. And, but yeah, I, I think for something like Nolan's for sure. Okay. I mean, every, I, I try to make all my training sessions where the, the pack was heavier than I would actually have at any given time on the BMT, whether idea. it was a, yeah, you know, whether it was a pound heavier or six or seven pounds heavier, mm-hmm. just to make it where, where it was like a mental thing too, right? Like if you know you've been on the hard rock course with a 15, 16 pound pack, it gives you a little more confidence and okay, well, you strip down to a 10 pound pack at three, four, 5,000 foot elevation, you know, I, I should, I should have some extra red, red blood cells. I'll have, you know, a little more strength already built up in the legs. So yeah. It, yeah. So I, I think it's a great idea. That's um, a good idea, man. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, as most ultra runners do so much of it's mental. And if you've gone out there a month ahead of time and actually done something a little bit harder, you know, carried a heavier uh-huh. pack, it just gives you a mental edge so that it's just like mm-hmm. just another day, you know? Right. Okay. Yeah. That's for sure. Cool. That's a great idea, man. I feel like, uh, I don't know, just you explaining it like that, like a light bulb just went off in my head and it makes a lot of sense. So yeah, like it, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So what made you, uh, so hell bent on, on this trail, the Benton McKay trail? I mean, is it just cause it's close to home for you or? Yeah, kind of is how that played out. So, so my grandma has a cabin up in North Georgia and the trail literally runs, I mean, a couple hundred yards from a cabin. Cool. So, yeah. So I was, when I was started going up there, I think it was maybe middle school or high school. Like as you're driving up the mountain, you'll see the white diamond blazes on the trees. Mm-hmm. And back then in my head, I was like, Oh, that's the AT. Like I just thought it was the Appalachian mm-hmm. trail. And I'm like, ah, cool, whatever, you know? And then, when I started getting into the ultras in 2013, 2014, I would go stay at the cabin and I would do a lot of training runs up on them mountains because you could get in good vertical for the West Coast, uh, for the West Coast races. So, you know, you, I'm training for 50 milers and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm just now starting to train for like 100Ks and maybe my first 100 miler and I'm out on the trail and I'm seeing the white diamonds and the white diamonds. And I'm like, huh, let me look and see how long the entire trail is, right? So you look it up, 300 miles. And you see Matt Kurt holding five days, 23 hours, 16 minutes. So in the back of your head, like you just, you, you start dreaming about, oh, I wonder if I could ever pull this off. I wonder if I could ever pull it off. So like, and of, of course, then I knew I didn't have the ability, but I'm like, okay, well, maybe if I grind out a few years of running hundred mile races, maybe I can finally build the strength to, to one day, maybe I could pull it off. So it was always, it was like, like, like as I trained for hundred mile races and completed hundred mile races in the back of my head, I was like, I just want to step closer to the BMT. Like, just keep, just keep grinding. And at some point you got to take a crack at it. Wow. And- Shoot, man. I think I lost you again. Uh, man, I don't know if you can hear me, but I think I lost you. Can you hear me? Back, I can hear you. Gotcha. No okay, worries, cool. man. I can piece these together. It's all good. Let's just pick. Okay, up. cool, cool. Okay, cool, cool. So I don't know where uh, I don't know where we left off, but yeah, it, or what you what was the final thing you heard? But uh, uh, I don't remember exactly where we were, man. Um, yeah, as you're talking about just, I guess we're talking about why I was so hell bent on the BMT or, or yeah, getting yeah. that one done. Yep, yep. Yeah. So, it, yes. Explain, explain exactly what the BMT is because it was originally supposed to be part of the Appalachian Trail, right? Or it was like the, uh, the original Appalachian Trail and they decided to route it in a different way. Is that right? I believe it was something to do with that, right? Because I believe Benton Mackay was the one who helped set up the AT. And I think at one point, maybe that was a, a proposed route and they didn't mm-hmm. go with it. And then I think it was, I don't know if it was in the 90s. At some point, they were looking at the route and they were like, hey, let's go ahead and let's do, let's finish this 300 mile route and call mm-hmm. it the Benton Mackay Trail. And it'll be like the more less traveled, more remote 
kind of a vision of like what he had at the AT, I, I believe, if I, if I remember correctly. And so it sort of runs parallel to the AT, right? Yeah, they do. Yeah. It, so they, does it like kind of figure eight around it as well? Like, is it, is it another option if you're, if you're taking the AT nor, northbound? Yeah. If you, yeah, there is like a big, there is some kind of big figure eight loop that you can do. It's They call it something. I can't think of the name of it right now, but yeah, it, I believe you could do that. Well, you could technically do it. I think where I started at the Northern terminus in Big Creek. So Big Creek State Park is right there. Uh, where the AT comes through Davenport Gap. Mm. So if you ever hear people run a SCAR, which is like the, the Appalachian Trail, Smoky Mountain section, they'll start at Fontana Dam and end at Davenport Gap. So that's where you could technically jump on it. and You could make a loop right there. I, I think you can do some other stuff too. But um, but yeah, so both of them, the Southern Terminus for both of them are at Springer Mountain. Springer Mountain. Yeah, at Springer Mountain. And then, yeah, they kind of run parallel and like the AT runs a little bit higher through the Smokies and then the uh, BMT runs a little bit lower through the uh, Smoky Mountains. Mm -hmm. And, um, but yeah, they, yeah, so there's, so that's kind of how the trail got created. And I think they finished it in 2005. Okay. So it's not a super old trail. Right, right. So, yeah, yeah. So it's, is it pretty popular or is it kind of overgrown out there? It's kind of it. There's sections. There's definitely sections where you'll get in where, where it's where it's overgrown. You'll definitely get into briars and different stuff like that. But man, compared to the compared to the condition of it in 2018, like I, I've got no complaints. Like it mm. was in such bad shape back <laughs> in 2018 that. Like when I got done, I like I hit up the Benton Mackay Trail Association and was asking them, you know, about this and that. And then I realized that my logistically it was the main mistake was something was an error I made going on the wrong section of the trail. But there was other sections of the trail that was the official route that were still really a lot of blowdowns, a lot of overgrowth, and um, they were super cool. And then me and my buddy were like, "Hey, can we come? You know, can we come and help y'all out?" So we we probably went up there. I don't maybe six, seven, eight weekends. Drove up and and helped them go. You know, clear out the bad sections and and seen all the work the guys put into it. And uh, that was one of the first people I that was one of the first groups I emailed when I got done and told them how much I appreciated all the work they'd put into the mm -hmm. trail over the last two years because it was ten times better than 2018. Okay, I mean, so I mean, yeah, but it's but as far as remote, it's definitely got like a real, it, it's got like a real remote feel. I mean, I might have seen now. Granted, I did it during the week, but I I seen 10, 15 total people. Mm -hmm. The entire time, wow. maybe. Five yeah, days. it's that's yeah, pretty it, remote. Yeah, it's it's yeah. remote. It's got that feel to it. Like when you're out there, you're, you know, at the end of day three, you know, the end of day four, but especially the end of day three. I mean, you were just in the middle of Tennessee, up on a ridge line in the middle of nowhere, and it's like an hour and a half drive in via mm -hmm. four service roads, and the service road literally just ends at the trail, mm -hmm. and it's just, it, yeah, you're when you yeah you feel like you, you feel remote, like you feel like you're out there. You're like. Yeah. You don't want anything to happen, you know. You're like, man, <laughs> for sure. I, I twist an ankle or get bit by a snake or something out here. It's like, oh, yeah. It's, this could be a this could be a sketchy situation for sure. And I'm so, guessing, yeah, you're carrying like a spot or a Delorme or something just in case for emergency and for, for people mm -hmm. to track you. Okay, so that, yeah, probably, yeah, yeah, it'll be safe. Good, good. Yeah. Um, why, did, why, reach. why did you decide to go southbound? I had always just thought about going southbound because I would be I would finish closer to the house. Like I would oh, finish perfect. in my backyard. Ah, sweet. So yeah, so my grandma's cabin is like fifty miles from the finish. Okay. So once I'm roughly uh I guess I'd have been two hundred and thirty eight miles into the route, I would hit the cabin mm. and actually would have the cabin to where I could take a shower eat something real quick did you use trash for a that, you did that you stopped at your grandma's oh, cabin yeah. oh yeah oh for nice. sure for Perfect. sure man. Oh, I could, man oh it was such a morale booster oh yeah that's a bonus yeah yeah that's so cool. yeah and so that was what you know when, when i was going up there in middle school that was what it inspired me you know i was always seeing the trail right there and like i said that's where that was kind of my base camp for training for all the west coast races was at the cabin on the bmt mm -hmm. and so like i was saying earlier i think we had some we we cut out on signal, but yeah, that's what that's what got me super interested in trying to get the SKT on the trail because I kept training on it for West Coast races. Um, okay. Yeah, so that's what got me really interested in it. And then so yeah, during the route, it was like okay, if I 
if I complete five days, I'm ending, I literally end at the cabin and I can go in there and take a shower, sleep in a real bed, you know, eat a pizza, eat some ice cream I left there. And then, uh, you know, fresh pair of shoes, fresh gear, and then one final push to get to the finish. Oof, that's, yeah. that's pretty slick right there. That, that, yeah. Yeah. I can see that being a pretty big morale boost. Yeah. That was sweet. Wow. That's cool, man. Yeah. <clears throat> so how much sleep were you getting out there? Like what was your longest day and what was your shortest day? Um, I think my shortest day, I'd have to look, I, uh, let me see. I, uh, I think 14, 15 hours was maybe my shortest day. Oh, wow. And uh, longest day was the final day. It was like 21 hours, I think. Okay. 21 mm -hmm. hours or maybe a little over 21 hours. So it – uh, and I just – I I don't do good sleeping. I just sleeping in random places anyways in the woods and like mm -hmm. camping. I've never slept great either. So it was like another thing I was trying to figure out, like how to get halfway decent sleep. Mm. And – uh so like the end of night one, like you basically, it's like a 50, like I do, I do, I always do like a 58 mile push on day one through the Smokies and it brings you to a road crossing. So at this road crossing, I had actually dropped a mat and a sleeping bag and my dinner and, uh, and my calories and stuff. So I get there, it's, I don't know, maybe 10, I don't know, maybe 11 o'clock at night or so get there, throw out the mat. And then I, it's so you can drive a road up to this spot out of Bryson city. Well, I didn't realize this was like some kind of hangout for high school teenagers. <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, 11, 12 o'clock at night, I'm sitting there eating, eating packs of rice and tuna and whatever. And these kids are going back and forth through the tunnel. And I'm like, I, can't, I couldn't believe they're out there on a Sunday at midnight, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, I got to go to sleep, you know? So like, I'm like laying in the woods, literally, you know, 20 foot off the road trying to sleep and there's groups of uh, like three, four, five teenage kids walking by every 30 minutes <laughs> and just like, and I'm like, are you shitting me? Like I would have never, you know, I would have never, you know, I would have never guessed. Right. So, wow. <laughs> so they're talking, so they're talking and doing whatever they're doing, keeping me up. So I slept maybe two, three hours the first night. Um, oh man, the next day you, uh, the next day you run to Fontana Dam, uh, which, Get you when you hit Fontana Dam, you're out of the Smokies and you're about 100 miles in. So the next day, I hit the dam and then you push on to Topoco Lodge. So day two, I've actually the trail literally goes right by a really nice lodge too. So on night two, I was able actually had a lodge, uh, a cabin already rented too. Mm -hmm. So I finished up day two. I mean, feeling great and uh, I mean, felt great. Finish coming running, everything's going perfect. Yeah, I hit the I hit the counter. They're checking me in, and then I'm I'm standing there, and I'm like, I feel like I'm about to faint, like I'm about to pass out, like out of nowhere. And I'm like, huh? So I sit down, and the woman at the desk is, you know, she sees it, and she's like, you you need something? You know, brings me a sprite, and I'm like, yeah, I appreciate it. So I'm sitting there sipping the sprite, and I'm like, and I'm like, man, I feel like I'm about to pass out. And then I'm like, I don't know what's going on. And so I've been ordered, I didn't put in a, a order for a pizza peanut butter pie so i'm like okay it's you know i'm, I'm I've, I've gotten here by like 9 30 so i'm like okay i'm about to eat shower i'm gonna sleep five six hours and get back to hammering you know take I, I get up to my cabin and i uh just get super weak and i'm like i'm just next thing i know i'm laying on the floor just throwing up mm. so i'm laying there throwing up and i'm so like i keep trying to stand up just to go take a shower and I don't have the strength to stand up and go take a shower. Oof. And I'm like, what in the world is going on? So I, I, man, so I lay there for like three hours just throwing up in a trash can, having ate one bite of anything, nothing. And I'm like, and then, so, and then my, so my left hand starts going numb. And I'm like, uh, that's not good. That's not I good. Think, I don't, I don't think that's good. So I'm literally laying there and it's, now it's, I don't know, you know, one o'clock in the morning okay. to, you know, one o'clock in the morning. I'm starting to think like, man, am I about like, if I do, I have something going on with the, you know, I got something going on with my heart, like, mm -hmm. or like, am I about to have a heart attack or like mm -hmm. what? You know, I've never had any kind of, and I know on my dad's side of the family, there's, there's heart stuff runs in it, like runs on his side of the family. He had a heart attack really young, a bunch of them had heart attacks young. So I'm like, so that's, you know, and you're tired, and you're, del you're halfway delusional, you've been covered, I've covered maybe 107 miles at this point. Uh, two days on, you know, and so I'm like, ah, like so I mean, it, it made me so nervous and I was felt so sick and was so weak that I actually called an ambulance and was wow. like, 
and was like, wow, I guess, I was like, I guess it's over. I guess I'm about to go. I guess I'm about to go to a hospital in North Carolina to get like an EKG and everything done. So the paramedic shows up and I go get just in the ambulance and he just sticks all, you know, puts all the sensors on me, checks my heart rate, checks my, uh, you know, my O2 level, sugar levels. And he's like, well, I can tell you're not having a heart attack. And I was like, okay, if I'm not having a heart attack, then I'm good. And he's like, and he's like, well, we can take you in, you know, we can take you in and we can have a doctor look at you and do more testing. And, nope. But hey, but yeah, but hey, you know, COVID's really bad around here. And he's like, telling me like how bad the cases are. And he's like, oh, the hospitals are kind of sketchy around. And I'm like, and I'm like, and I'm like, that's the last thing I need is to catch COVID. You know what I mean? So then I'm like, and then in my head, I'm like, okay, well, all they did was check my heart rate. And I was like, and I didn't take an IV or nothing. I was like, so that shouldn't affect anything on the attempt. I was like, they literally just put all the pads on me, you know, check the whole, check the heart rate and, you know, two levels and all that. So I'm like, okay, well, I should be good. So I go back inside. It's 3.30. I, I just I slept for like four hours, put all my devices back on charge just in case. And I get up at 7.30 and I'm just kind of like I get dressed. I don't feel horrible. And then they have a hot breakfast at 8 o'clock. So I walk down there, eat a big breakfast. And by this time, it's like 9 o'clock. And I'm like, well, I guess I'll just take off up the mountain. And if I feel really bad, I'll just double back and come back to the lodge and mm-hmm. try to get a ride into town to get a rental car. Mm-hmm. And the lady at the front desk is like, yeah, I've got to go get my rental car later today, too. So if you need a bell, let me know this and that. And, and right out of the lodge, there's like an eight, eight and a half mile hike up to the ridge. And it's like about 5,000 foot of vertical because you just go right from the river right back to the ridge. So I hike up to the top of it and I'm feeling OK. And I'm like, well, let me just. Let me just keep on pushing forward. You know what I mean? Let me just keep pushing forward. So it made it. So I got in late on day three. I got in late on day three, and that kind of put me like four or five hours behind the ball. So like the rest of the time, it, it like I was always trying to make up ground mm-hmm. for the night two incident. So, so yeah, I got a, maybe three, four hours of sleep that night. And then every single night from there on out, man, it was maybe – maybe two or three hours you know mm-hmm. maybe two or three and i'd wake up and it'd be 3 30 or 4 30 in the morning or whatever and i'd just get up eat breakfast and get back to moving because i was like you know it just it wasn't happening you know yeah <laughs> so, yeah, yeah so were you sleeping on the trail the remainder of those nights or did you have yeah that up so night three and night four uh night three i had an ammo box dropped and i also had a wet sack that had a uh I had an air pad in it and an air pillow. Okay. So I blew them up and just slept right in the middle of the trail. And <sighs> middle of the trail, well, kind of off the trail there as well. Yeah. And then night five is where I get to the cabin and was able to, uh, get i think i laid i think i actually laid down at, i think i laid down at 10 or 10 30 there but i woke up at 1 30 so i just got up ate a big breakfast and i think it was by like 3 30 a.m i was back on the trail for the for the final day okay for the final okay. push so, so that's what i was I, like i'm always interested in the logistics and how this whole thing is set mm-hmm. up like a day or two ahead of time so it sounds like you had a couple sleeping bags set up out there with a couple different air pads and um, so, so were you able to get this all set up in a day? I mean, it's a 300 mile trail. Did it take yeah. a couple of days to get all that set up or what did that look like? I, it, I should have did it over two days, uh-huh. but I did it over, but I did it over a day. Okay. So, well, no, I, I, so when I come into town, I went to my sister's house and then we went and bought all the food and I had, uh, I think it was on Friday. So I had all day on a Friday to weigh out all my calories, get everything separated. And I uh, had f- five different ammo boxes. So I had every single ammo box set up ex- and I knew exactly where I was going to leave them at. But I, so on Saturday, uh, me and Sarah started doing the drive mm. uh, northbound. Okay. So as we drove along the trail, let me see, we had to stop at the end of day one and drop one. At the end of day two, I had to drop one. End of day three, end of day four. Yeah, so basically, so basically I had four drops that I had to leave out there. So, I, so it took, I mean, it's probably 11, 12 hours on Saturday 
drive and this is the day before i'm gonna start right <laughs> so we're just, we're driving up and then i'm get, then i get freaked out i'm like what if a black bear gets into one of these boxes and then i get sure. here and i don't have the food and it messes me i'm 150 or 200 miles in so then we stop and get rope and then then and then we're you know we're out there uh-huh. taking rocks and ropes and trying to so throw you're them hanging them the, yep. yeah okay so then, yeah so then we start so we start hanging them and uh, we get them hung. We, we finally get them all dropped. And then here we are now up in North Carolina. And it's 10.30 at night, 10.45 at night. And I'm supposed to be starting at 5 a.m. the next day. So here, <laughs> so, so it's like 11 o'clock at night. And I'm like, okay, well, maybe we'll push it back to a 6 a.m. start, <laughs> yeah. which isn't great. But so I didn't sleep. So even the night before, I slept maybe two or three hours. Mm. Just And so I'm like, well, it is what it is. So. Uh, <laughs> so maybe two or three hours the night before yeah. and uh got over to big creek and started i think it's 6 15 a.m on uh that sunday on the fourth i believe okay. and uh yeah and then so it just I, I you know so i knew you know so i had that so that's how logistically i set it up and dropped it um so stuff at the end of the day one stuff at the lodge on day two uh stuff at sandy gap on day three and then up above Thunder Rock Campground was day four drop. And then the cabin was day five drop. And then uh, obviously from the cabin, you're just trying to get the Springer Mountain and hold it together. Got it. Wow. So that's, yeah, so that's how, that's how logistically it played out. And then, you know, obviously when, then once I was done, I got a rental car this Monday and drove back up. Got to go route. back and get everything. <laughs> <laughs> so all day Monday, oh, dude. all day Monday, yeah, I drove and, and picked everything up. And then I think I was in my dad's driveway for four hours Tuesday, just washing everything, soaking everything, <laughs> and you know, buckets of water and soap, and just doing the whole cleanup process and and washing clothes. So yeah, I've got a solid. I probably got three, four days just in all the, just the logistical stuff. Like you, yeah. it's, it's, a, I don't know. It's less work than I guess a, a crew or managing a crew, but it's still a lot of work, you know? Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, five days to run the thing, but I mean, you're still looking at eight days just between <laughs> getting everything set up and the little stressors here and there. So yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'm always interested in what's going on behind the scenes and you know, yeah. without a crew, you're doing it all. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I, and, and I had kind of been thinking about different ways to do it and different ways to keep it light. And I was like, okay, well, if I drop a separate pad and, and bag at this spot, well, then I don't have to carry it for 50 miles here or 60 mm-hmm. miles here. Mm-hmm. And so it was just, it was just different. And, you know, and these little, these little pads and bags and stuff you can get for so cheap now that I'm like, well, man, if that's going to, if that's going to save me two, three, four pounds on my back. Oh, yeah. I was like, I'll just cough up the, I'll just cough up the money mm-hmm. and I'll just leave them there. Then I'll go pick them up and I'll just donate them or, you know, I'll donate them or uh, give them away whenever I get done. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, yes, yeah, so I, I thought about just different strategies just for, for, for weight management mm-hmm. mostly, you mm-hmm. know, and I was able to pull it off with just the, uh, we just had uh, that Solomon 12 liter back, which 12 liter. Is, that, that thing is solid, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I was going to yeah. ask you uh, what was your what was your pack weight? Do you have a, a rough estimate? And did you work really super hard to keep that light? I, you know, I need to. I, I didn't have a good scale before I started, but it. I'm thinking. I mean, I was pretty close to probably ten pounds most of the time, because that was another thing with me resupplying the food at the end of every single day then I only had maybe two, two and a half pounds in, in food weight. And I was constantly pulling from streams, uh, streams and rivers to keep the water weight down. Okay. And then, yes, yeah, so I was able to keep it pretty low. I need to load the pack back up identical, exactly how I had it. Cause it, it, maybe, maybe I was able to get it actually to eight, nine pounds. I think, mean, I think I had some days and sometimes where it might've got under 10 and then I think I had other periods where it was definitely probably a little over 10. Okay. Um, yeah, because from day, because I actually carried my sleeping gear from the end of day three to the end of day four. So day four, I actually had an extra, uh, at least two pounds on me. So, so yeah, it may have, it may have ended up being more like 12 on that day or somewhere around in there, but it was definitely lighter than what I was training with okay. uh, at elevation. So, yeah. yeah. So that, yeah. So that mm-hmm. helped a lot. Yeah. 
Um, I'm not super familiar with his area down there. I ran the Cruel Jewel a few years back down in Georgia, uh -huh. but like, yep. it, um, it, is wild boars is like a thing down there. Did you see any wild boars or was that an issue or is it something you don't even worry about? I don't even, I don't, I, I've never really worried about them. I think I've seen okay. one the entire run, but okay. so, so Cruel Jewel is on the Benton Mackay Trail on my final day. Oh. So when you went out, so when you went out and you hit the, well, you come off of the DRT on your way out and you hung a right onto the Benton Mackay Trail. Yes. And that's the Benton Mackay Trail that you dropped down into Skeena Gap on. Okay. And then you ran that, that's all Benton Mackay Trail all the way to like Old Dial Road and where the bridge and all that's at that you oh, were on. Yep. That's all BMT up. Um, it gets off the BMT for a little bit over there by Fall Branch Falls. But you climb a different trail back to the top of the BMT up to a ridge line. And then you go out to the turnaround and the turnaround gets off the BMT for a minute. And then you come back to the high ridge and that's the BMT. And then you're back on the BMT. Go so you've, so you've, so you've been on some of, uh, you've been on some of the North Georgia BMT stuff that that's actually was part of my, uh, last day. Okay. Was hitting, was hitting, um, a good chunk of the same trails. Probably, I don't know, maybe 20 ish, maybe 20 ish, 25 of the same miles from cruel drool. Okay. But, uh, but yeah, no, it's it, I, no. As far as wild boars and stuff, I never really thought much about them. Um, I had one. I had one more. Like the second morning around Fontana Lake, I probably ran into seven, eight different black bears. I don't. They were all mm -hmm. just down there next to the next to the lake. I guess eating berries or something. Mm -hmm. But it was just like one little like thirty mile stretch where I just kept running into them like so much so that I put on a podcast like where the audio was going out just to oh. kind of scare him off because okay. I just kept running up on so many of them. <laughs> I ran I ran up on a big old boy one time and he just kind of shuffled off looking at me and I'm like, mm, uh, you know what I mean? Like, and then, uh, you know, and then at the end of night three, I ran right up on a big timber rattler, which mm. I was like, I was like, I, I was, I was surprised they were still out, you know, because the sun started cooling off. Sure. He was right in the middle of the trail, though, mm. just chattering away. And I did a big, <laughs> uh, I did a big detour around him. Um, <laughs> hey, yeah, I did a big detour around him, and then, but yeah, the, I, yeah, the, yeah, there wasn't a whole lot. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Out there, there's not too much that okay. that really worries me too much. You know what I mean? I would just, I was putting the food ten or fifteen foot from me. And if I woke up in the middle of the night and a bear was in it, I was just going to hope that I could holler at him and get him to run off because sure. I literally needed the calories the next day for myself, you know, and I was just <laughs> hoping I could scare one off. But I was like, well, I'm definitely not sleeping like with the food in my bag or right here next to me. So I would just sit at 20 foot down the trail and just hope, you know, nothing got into it, but nothing ever, nothing messed with any of my ammo boxes. Uh, nothing really annoyed me to mess with me at night so for every once in a while you know you'd have the one random mosquito when you're trying to sleep three hours the the one that's still alive and flying around yeah buzzing your ear you know and you're like you, you know it's stuff like that and, no, and I, high school kids running around <laughs> uh yeah who would ever thought yeah, yeah you know wow yeah so i had that yes yeah, so i had that going on but man it i mean for the most part man i got really i got really lucky with the weather I, I planned kind of that window back in June. I was looking at like the moon cycles and looking at how much daylight versus night light. Um, was hoping I could get like the cool fall temperatures, but still get the 12 hours of daylight and not have too many leaves down on the trail. So I was trying to just see if I could slip it in and it just like, as I got closer and closer, the window was almost perfect. And I'm like, okay, well you got to go for it. Cause that was one of the things I said after last time. I was like, I will never try this again unless I have, almost ideal weather for all mm -hmm. six days mm -hmm. um yeah so i did it yeah so I, I got super lucky super blessed on the weather good um man yeah it got a little warm you know it was day four day five got a little hot but you know what it wasn't wasn't pouring rain on me the entire time yeah you know? so yeah. i couldn't complain man good good yes sir that's awesome man i mean you 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 earned it. You were up against adversity a couple years back and uh, you did it, man. So congrats, dude. I mean, it's a no. huge accomplishment. Like how did you celebrate at the end? Did you uh, man. pass out and sleep or did you eat a big meal or what did that look like? Uh, so, so my dad, my mom, uh, my sisters, uh, 
probably six, seven, eight, nine other real good friends that I've had from trail running and ultra running. They all, they all come out in the spring to meet me. And mm. the last, the last 10 miles of the run, the, the, some hurricane weather did blow in. So the last 10 miles I'm going to finish up and the wind's blowing through the trees. It's pouring rain and, and it, uh, and it, it was, it was, it was weird. It was like a flashback to 2018, but it was only for the last 10 miles of the very last day, uh-huh. you know? So at that so point, you got it in the bag, and you're just gonna, no matter what, yeah, at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, <laughs> it gave it, it gave it that kind of, it gave it like a kind of epic feel to finish it. It was kind of like the trail was like, I don't, it was, it was weird, man. It was like the trail was, uh, I, I don't know, it was just like a weird final way to finish, and it was like a flashback to 2018, and it just is pouring rain, wind blowing through the trees, but still, even five miles out, I was like. I will be the guy that the top of one of these trees blows out of the top of it or a branch and hits me <laughs> and I get impaled five miles from the finish and I still don't get it. I still don't get an FKT. So uh, I, I, I didn't, I didn't think I had it in the bag to literally could damn near see Springer mountain, you know? So, uh, so I'm finishing up just, you know, mount, you know, it's just super foggy. And like I said, it had a really cool epic feel to it to finish up in. And then so when I finish up like two miles from the finish, there's a road crossing. So all my, my family, all my friends are standing at the road crossing. So I get to see all of them as I come through and I holler at them and cool. I holler at them and holler at me. And then um man, so I've got two, you know, two two more miles and it's you know. One more, one more mile, mile and a half of climbing, and then you hook around a corner and there's a, a bit in Mackay Memorial that I've been I couldn't wait to see and I've been thinking about it the whole time. So I stopped, touch the memorial for a second, and then you got, I mean, it's maybe a couple hundred yards and you come into the southern terminus. So this is 1 a.m. Friday night and just weather's crazy. So yes, I just do I just hung out with family and friends and and uh man, drink a drink a little champagne. There you go. Uh hung out, you know, shot the shit, mm-hmm. you know, told a couple tales. Went back to the cabin and, uh, man, just, I just had like, an, I think I ate just something, I think I ate some eggs and a burrito or something and passed out for maybe five, six hours, man. And just, and just woke up because I just, it, man, it's hard to express to them and to anybody like what it, what that trail meant to me and like how, how much of a goal of it it was to, you know, it, it just such a, such a huge goal. It was the biggest goal I'd ever made for ultra run mm. and to finally hit it, like it just, I can you know what I mean? It was just hard to express what it meant to me, to everybody else. And even to myself, it was hard to express, to, you know, I mean, even for the last week, I've been sitting around and I'm just popping my head and I get a smile on my face and I'm like, I cannot believe I pulled that off. Like, I can, <laughs> like, like it really, you know, the last five or 10 miles is like, man, I feel, I was like, man, it's like, it's like operating outside the matrix or something. I'm mm-hmm. like, am I really about to pull this off? I cannot believe this nice. is about to happen. Yes. And it was just super, yeah, he's super stoked, man. So satisfying. It's just so much, so much time and thought and energy put into all the training and all the miles and all the logistics and just, and just, you know, there's so much that can go wrong on that, in that long of a time period. Mm-hmm. And, um, Man, it was it was it was awesome. It was awesome to pull it off. It, cool. it, you know, I'm, yeah, man. It, Dude. Yeah, it, it it felt yeah. Like I said, I it just it was epic, man. I mean, it's it's got to be hands down. Uh, you know, more satisfying to finish something like this than your, you know your typical hundred miler. I mean, just being out there for five days, three hundred miles. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I I mean, I'm guessing that part of, part of this, uh, this year was, you know, due to COVID, like, you know, everybody's races were canceled. So a lot of people are out doing their own sort of self curated events. And there was a lot of FKTs and a lot of Nolan's uh, stuff going on this year. Do you like looking back now, do you prefer the, the self curated events over the race or like, what's your future look like? Um, yeah, I mean, if it, if it really means something to you, like if the Nolan's 14 line really means something to you, if you're mm-hmm. really inspired and, and motivated by something, then, then sure, go do that. You know what I mean? Like, but mm-hmm. if, but if hard rock is your end all be all, then, you know, then do that. Right. Mm-hmm. So it, the BMT for me, was always higher than anything on the list in any oh, yeah. race, just personally for me. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, 
I think that's why it was so special. That, that being said, though, like, like I would, I mean, I would love to run hard rock. I don't know if I'll ever, I don't know if I'll ever get in. I'm starting to think I might just have to drop ammo boxes on that course and just run it by myself. You know sure. what I mean? Like, yeah, it's yeah. really, it's, it's really like that now. You know, mm-hmm. I'm like, well, uh-huh. so that, I mean, that's a cool race. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of cool races, but, um, but yeah, I guess it all depends though, right? Like, if I got into hard rock, I'd be super stoked to go run that route too. Um, but yeah, it, it, currently though, I can't. There's there's nothing else right now that that feels like that special to me, or nothing mm-hmm. that's like that. That you know what I mean? It's like that mm-hmm. motivating to mm-hmm. me. Mm-hmm. Um, and and kind of even before all the COVID stuff, I was like, if I put in a good, if I put in, if I if I have a good year, this fall is when I'd like to do the BMT anyways. Mm. So I was gonna do Bighorn, and that got canceled. Mm-hmm. And Bighorn okay. was yeah, you know, Bighorn was before another hard rock qualifier mm-hmm. is was the goal of it so um i'm currently signed up for it in 2021 so if it you know if it, if it all pans out and i can you know if i can run by then i hope you know maybe i'll go uh maybe i'll try to knock out bighorn to get a qualifier for sure but yeah right now man i don't yeah right now I don't, you know and then like, nolan's is right there too honestly back when i was driving out to colorado it was either Nolan's or BMT this fall. Mm. And I was looking at Labor Day, like tentatively for the Nolan's. And I was going back and forth, back and forth. And then, like I said, I listened to that podcast with String Bean about him setting the long trail FKT. And after I listened to the podcast, I was, my heart was, my heart was set on the BMT. You know what I mean? And I was like, that's, that's what I need to do. I was like, now that I'm living in Colorado, I can train all the time on the Nolan's course. I can, uh, and that and I want it, and the Nolan's dude is such a such a tough route. I yeah. mean, the more you train on it, it, dude, the more you train on the Nolan's route, the more it scares me. Like the, <laughs> I mean, like I, I, you I know what I mean? Like, I was, no, I hear you. Yeah. I've been yeah. out there for years scouting that thing, and yeah. Uh, yeah, it's always been overwhelming. It's always been daunting. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, I have a buddy who just finished it this year, but it took him uh, 72 hours to finish the thing, you know, and he yep. was just committed to finishing the line. He, he was like, well, if I'm not going to get in 60, I'm just going to finish it. And I was there nice. when he finished and I'm just like, Jesus, man. I mean, this thing is just so huge. I mean, uh, I know, yep. man, like the more I scout it. Yeah, you're right. The more I scout it, the more time I spend out there, the more nervous I get, I, I, I think, but yeah. Yeah. I don't know. yeah. It's one of, yeah, it's a uh, I, I respect that line oh, so dude. much, Yeah, you know, I, and, I, and for me coming from being a sea level guy, I was like, you know what? I was like, I think I need all summer and all winter and then all of next spring in 2021 to try to be fully acclimated and get full try to get as much strength as possible climbing because i don't I, I don't i don't think i'm a great climber or i'm not a great climber i'm way better at descending and flats and and uh stuff like i you know i'd way rather bomb down a mountain than hike up one okay so like i've got to get i've got to get like my hiking speed up at 12 13 14 thousand foot just like more efficient and get just a little stronger and if i can get if i can get if i can get fitter on the ups you know, then I think it gives me a possibility of trying to get in under 60, you know, mm-hmm. but like, I, I know, like I'd be really pushing it close if I'd have trained all summer and then took a crack at it. I mean, maybe I, who knows it? Like I said, I, dude, I respect it so much. I don't even like talking about it. Like oh, I really I feel like when people, like, when people like start talking about Nolan's out loud and stuff, I'm like, man, I hope you've been out there. Cause I, I've been out there enough to where it, it, I literally respect it that much where it's like, I don't even like talking about it out loud, man. I hear it's you. A, I hear so, you. it's so nasty. No, same here, dude. Same here. And it's like, yeah. When, when I have friends that are like, okay, I'm going to do Nolan's this summer. And it's just like, man, I can't, I can't even believe you're saying that. Just like saying the words is scary. I don't know, man. And then yeah, you, man. You get guys like Joey that just go out there and, and just destroy it. Like it's so easy. So yeah it's all, it's but, all perspective i guess yeah perspective and their mentality and them guys are just climbers man they're yeah. cl- the the rate at which they can climb blows my mind yeah. but i i mean it just the yeah i mean he was like what what do you i think i think i read on joey's he's like oh, i started getting into climb and shape and i was doing uh what do you say i was doing 2500 foot of vertical an hour 
And I said elevation. And I'm like, Jesus <laughs> Christ, bro. Like 25. <laughs> like, you know, I'm like, uh, I'm trying to, like, I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to get to where I want to sum up at 12, 13, 14. I can do like, what, 2,000 foot an hour. And mm-hmm. uh, I, I know, like, every time I talk to Andrew about it, he's like, yeah, you want to be trying to get about 1,000 foot every 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. Like, that's the kind of shape you need to be, your climbing shape needs to be in for knowledge. And then he's just, and then Joey was like, well, I got into 2,500 foot an hour shape. And I'm like, my God, man, you know, so like it it just, and then the dude can descend. I mean, I, you know, and then the way he just gets down a mountain too is ridiculous. If you watch him, you know, going down one, it's like, my God. So, so yeah, yeah, so that's a, that's a really cool, you know, inspiring line too that, Mm -hmm. uh, that, um, that I was looking at earlier this summer. And, I, and I've been out there for the last couple, the last couple of years with Sarah doing a lot of scouting. Yeah. And so, you know, a lot of her scouting trips, I was with her on and on, on her first couple of attempts, I paced her, you know, five or six or seven of the peaks and, and stuff like that. So I've gotten in some good, I've gotten in a couple 20, 24 hour sessions on the line with a heavy pack, not acclimated, which scared me even more. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so, so that, yeah, so pop, maybe, I don't know, maybe look into that next year or something, sure. you know? So what about you? You going to, you going to, you think about taking another crack at oh, it next dude. year? Yeah. It's, I, I can't just let it go at this point. I've put so much time into it now. It's like, if I let it go, I feel like I'm just, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. So, you know, I feel like, yeah, I feel like it, it's on my list and it, it just has to be checked off at some point. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well then you got, yeah, look me you, up if you're coming out, man, I, you, I'd like to do some scouting with you for sure. But yeah. well, yeah. Dude, so like I said, I'm living over on the West side of Denver now, man. So if you want to um, go out and if you want to go out and jump on the line, let's do it. Oh, for I've, sure. Man. For sure. Yeah. So I've, I've, I've got to see a bunch of cool little, you know, cool little routes and lines mm-hmm. and a pig mm-hmm. Sarah's brain and Andrews and Andrea's and, and all them guys. So yeah, I'm definitely, yeah. If you ever want to go scout it, I'm down, man. Okay. Awesome. Um, well, keep me but in yeah, mind. you got, yeah. Yeah. You I got know. the right vibe though, man. You got the right, you, you got the right energy about it. That's exactly how I was about BMT. I couldn't let it go. It was yeah. always in my subconscious or consciously in the back of my head of like, like you can't, you got to go back. Yeah. You can't get beat down and not go back and get another, get another shot mm-hmm. at that one, man. You it's know, one of those so that's the mentality. Like, like if I were to let it go, it'd be one of those things I'd be on my deathbed just going, ah, I wonder if I ever could have, or I wish yep. I would have, you know, and I just, yeah, so I yep. can't let it go. Yep. Uh, yep. Yeah. And you know what, man, I, I got no problem going out there and felling. It's, but I mm-hmm. really regret this stuff that I don't go back and try. You know what yeah, I mean? Like I, sure. I just would rather... You know, and you start doing this kind of stuff, and you got to post a public link to your tracker. So then you get to, so then you get to fail publicly, right? So it's oh, like that yeah. was a, that's a new angle. Yeah. So I'm literally laying there on that second night, and I'm like, well, great. I guess I get to post a second time that I failed <laughs> on the BMT, and I didn't even make it. I didn't even make it as far as last time. Mm. And, you know, so that's like another angle. So yeah, it's uh, it, it's tough mentally, but. Then again, I, it, it, you know, sometimes it holds you to the fire too. If you know you got people watching you on that yep. tracker, you know. Yep. Yep. So that's, that's good stuff, though, man. Yeah, that's why I go back and forth with the, uh, you know, self-supported and having a crew. Like, mm. you know, when some sometimes, mm-hmm. sometimes when your crew comes out to a hundred mile race, you know, especially if they're coming out from a different location. I feel like I can't let them down, man. They traveled all this way to help me realize my dreams. Like I've got to do it. But then, you know, I, I've been hearing so much logic and with the self-supported thing too. Like there's just, I'm not a fast enough guy to, to stop and sit down and chat and have someone make me a burrito. Like I got to keep on moving. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. There's, there's different ways of looking at it, obviously, but yeah, um, real quick, like yeah, sure. I'm curious about your training. Like, what does your training look like? Is it, is it just strictly running or are you like throwing weights around too? Or what are you getting up to? I need, man, I- I, I always get done with a block and I'm like, I should have did more strength and I should have did more speed work and I should have did more intervals and I should have did, you know, more of this and that. But like with this one, man, it was so, it was so much different than like a hundred mile race to where I knew I was going to have just so much time on feet and so much weight on my back that I was like, man, I feel like I need to spend 90, 95% of my time mimicking what I'm going to do for six days. Mm-hmm. So as as far as training for this one, it was more the mileage 
kind of didn't look that high because it was all at elevation and it was all up 14ers and on ridge lines and all kind of stuff like that. So the mileage, I think my mileage really only got in to maybe 70 to 80 miles, but it was all like 70, 80 miles of like legit Colorado backcountry stuff. So it, it kind of, it was more like 20, I want to say it was more like 20 to 25 hours a week is what I was doing on, is what I was doing in the mountains. Uh, most of that with a 10 to 15 pound pack. Um, it, you know, a lot of, you know, on the weekdays, a lot of times it was eight, nine, 10 miles around uh, Green Mountain over right out my back door in, uh, in Lakewood. Mm. Not, not the Boulder Green Mountain, but, uh, yeah, the Lakewood. The, I've been out there. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. But that Green Mountain right there, right? So I would go, you know, and there was a little spot where I could get 500 foot of gain in half a mile. So I would go over there and I'd hit that and I uh, was trying to get efficient on the climb and in the descents with the extra weight. So I, I did a lot of, you know, a lot of weekday stuff was, you know, like that eight, nine, 10, 12 mile range. Uh, Thursday nights, me and my buddy Jake would go do like Mount Morrison repeats mm. um, to try to get better, more efficient with climbing. And, and um, that was like a common a common thing. And then Saturday, Sundays, man, were, uh, were almost always like long back-to-back stuff. Mm-hmm. It, it was like I, I knew I only had like, you know, you get out there in June and it's like June 15th and it's like, okay, well, I've only got so many Saturday, Sundays or I've only got so many Friday, Saturday, Sundays. So even on Friday nights, if I drove like – like I remember one weekend, like on a Friday night, I drove over to the, the – what was it Pony Buchanan Loop? Is that how you said it? Oh, yeah, Pony the, the, Buchanan. The, the, yep. Yep. Yeah. Up in Indian, so, uh, the what's it called? The uh, Indian Peaks. That's it. Yeah. 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 So, like, I drove over there on a Friday night. And uh, I think, like, that morning, I think I did 22 or 23. And that's where you're hitting the different passes and stuff and then crashing the backcountry. Then got up, went and did another 15 or 20 on Sunday. And that was with the heavy pack and all the sleeping gear and getting used to sleeping in the back country. So I did a, a lot of stuff like that to where I was just picking out, you know, picking out lines where I was going to get in a bunch of vertical, a bunch of descent at elevation, and I could start testing the gear. And then I, I tried to have one day a week where I would go hit the gym and do like a bunch of like PT type stuff. Like, like my right, my right hip gives me issues like the side of the, like the glute medius and, and the side of my right butt cheek basically. So I would do a bunch of, uh, a bunch of stuff with the resistance bands and one legged stuff and one legged kettlebell stuff to where it was anything one legged that would mimic running, right. To build up like that coordination and that stability strength. So I had to do a lot of that to build up my right, my right side. Cause it was another issue that I had in 2018. My right hip gave me some of it's, so was in so much pain I couldn't hardly sleep at night mm-hmm. so I knew I had to really build up my right side uh for another attempt so yeah I tried I did a bunch of stuff more like that but even like the upper body stuff I would do like on that one day a week it was geared toward running whether that be pull-ups dips push-ups anything you know anything that you know is going to make you stronger and more efficient like on the trekking poles when you're hiking up or down with your, mm-hmm. you know anything the push-ups and the dips for your triceps and your chest um, anything to keep the back strong, the lower back, you know, I do lower back stuff for the, uh, you know, lower back stuff, core stuff, but I, you know, I wish I would have done more in the last probably five weeks. I did more stuff in the gym than I probably did the entire blog. because so I feel like I actually put, got in a bunch of strength during the taper oh. or during the certain taper down. So I got in a bunch of strength and I kind of did a little more, uh, like anaerobic work toward the last probably six or seven weeks to where I would do uh, like Tabatas on the rower, Tabatas on the bike. Uh, so it's kind of like I built, it's kind of like I built up a long, big, steady base over the summer. And it was kind of like I was fine tuning it and trying to like sharpen the fitness right toward the end. It's, it's kind of how I do it. Uh, so yeah, basically just just trying to put in big weeks with with weight on my back and mileage, and then try to get into PT stuff when I could and the strength stuff to help out. Mm-hmm. Um, it's how I would do it, and you know, anytime I could jump in a hot tub and stretch and roll out, and uh, man, I'm a huge believer in the hot tub. 
Mm-hmm. Like it just like I don't like I don't I don't I should spend more time you know rolling out doing all the stretching mm-hmm. doing all the recovery, but something about jumping in a hot tub is like I can get in there and I'll spend 15, 20 minutes just stretching everything and trying to open everything back up. Um, it's big on that, big on the Epsom salt baths, which is, mm-hmm. you know, essentially kind of the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, just dude, just listening to the body, man. You know, you yeah. have them days where it's like, you're, you're smoking. You're like, okay, well, is this going to hurt me or help me? Mm-hmm. And then a lot of times it's just like, you know what, tonight's night I need to just take off and rest. Sure. So just listening to the body, you know, man, I don't, I don't, you know, just cause I think I, you know, just cause I'm like, oh, I'm going to do 80 miles this week and 25,000 foot of vertical. It's like if you ain't feeling it, then I'm, it's just more beneficial to sleep than it is to go sludge up a mountain. You know what I mean? So I just yes. was real. Yeah. So I just, you know, to me, everything was, you know, anything could be changed at any time based on how I was feeling mm-hmm. is, is how I did it. But it was a lot of just getting, you know how it goes, man. It's just, just a lot of getting out there and getting it done and putting in the hours and putting in the reps and mm-hmm. Just putting on the headlamp and putting in the work, man. I mean, there's so much, you know, you know how it goes. There's been three, four months leading up to it. There's so much work you're out there doing on your own that nobody sees. And, but I mean, that's what, that's what makes you solid. You know, that's, that's what gets you to the finish is all the work nobody else sees. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so that's, that's how I, that's how I approach it. That's yeah. how I train. Yeah. yeah. Your training sounds pretty similar to mine. It's like, um, you know, when you have a full-time job, you only have so much time. So it's a little bit here and there on the weekdays. You're, you're maybe fitting in two a days around a work schedule or something and the weekends going out there and hitting it hard. But I kind of mm-hmm. do the same thing. It's like, you know, if I get to a certain point in the week where I have a run planned, but I just feel wrecked or my body just feels tired. It's like, I know that my body just needs to rest right now. And I'm just going to nix this workout. I don't want to, you know, but I don't, you know, I have to let myself do it and not feel like a failure because I can tell that my body needs this rest. Mm-hmm. And then tomorrow I'm going to feel that much better. So it sounds like right. You're right in the same track. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, and then like, even if, like I had a two week taper plan, but I ended up turning that into a three week taper because i I was running down Mount Falcon and slipped and fell and just smashed my left knee. So my left knee, left quad, and left shoulder were just black and blue, and I couldn't run for a week. <laughs> and then when I went out to do the soft rock to do the training session on that, I could feel my left knee, and I kept tweaking it. And then it snowed, Then I'm training in the snow and the mud, and that tweaked it. So I was like, okay. I, so I did a three-week taper just trying to like get my left knee to fully heal before I started the 300 mile run. But then I've got that mental, you know, then you get, you know, then mentally you've got that against you too, right? Like that's the only thing in the back of your head. What if you get 30 miles in and your left knee is just Mm -hmm. blown out already. Mm -hmm. So, so like that was kind of freaking me out. But so same thing, like you were saying, like just adapting your training to what you got going on. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I did a three week taper and I mean, I did not run a lot of miles over them three weeks. It mm. was all like bike, rower, mm. uh, weights, a lot of cross training, and I just a lot of PT on my left knee. And then mm. me just crossing my fingers and just hoping when I started the run. I mean, I literally was like 15 or 20 miles into the run. I'm like, well, I don't feel my left knee yet. So I guess we're good to go. <laughs> so <laughs> so it was like, a, you know. I've totally been there. I've totally been yeah. there. Like you start of the race, like, don't know how this is going to go. You get 10 miles in, you're like, okay, I'm feeling pretty good. I guess it's on. <laughs> guess it's going to, yep. Guess it's going to hold up. Thank uh, God. You know, dude, I know you just, you know, it'd, it'd be nice to just go into a race or an event like this, just feeling a hundred percent at some point, like, but it, yep. I, I don't think it's ever going to happen you know there's there's always like life events or some little niggle in the knee or the hip Mm -hmm. or something and it's like you're never going to be a hundred percent but yeah do what you can with what you have yeah for sure and i and you know mine's always like overuse stuff so this was like the first time i ever had an injury where it was actually from falling and and smashing my knee on a rock you know so then it was like a week it was another weird angle so i'm like did i mess up my meniscus did i like what you know what i mean so Mm -hmm. You know, so it was another kind of weird, just mental, mental thing to, to process and to try to just, I know it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. You know, so, you know, how it goes. it's always something. So I thought like, I literally was like, okay, I've made it through a whole block. I'm good to go. Like, this is going to be the first good block I put in. And then I, then I fell running down Mount Falcon and it was like, (laughs) oh man. And of all places too, right. You know what I mean? Like all the crazy stuff I've been on that summer, like I'm going to. Uh, one of the mountains in the backyard, you know, 
<laughs> and fall, man. That's how it goes, though, you know? The gods just wanted to check to see if you really wanted to do this thing, you know? It's yep. like, I know, sometimes that stuff happens. Yeah. I'm like, it's just a test. I just have to make it through this little <laughs> test, and I'll get it. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, well, man. you did it, man. You did it. Hats off. Congrats, man. I mean, you're a badass, and it just sounds like an awesome adventure, man. So congrats yeah. to you and i appreciate you taking this time to chat with me man and and stay in touch i'd love to do some nolan stuff with you next year uh whether it's For scouting sure. or, or whatever but um i'm yeah. out there scouting around pretty much every year and i didn't really have an attempt on the calendar this year but yeah I, i've i've talked so much about it it's like i just you know I, i'll get yeah, after it eventually it. so For yeah sure. yeah. We'll, yeah we'll get out there and uh share some share some routes and go check out a few things together and yeah, I'm thinking the same thing. I might, I might just drop ammo boxes on it and just have a couple ammo boxes out there and, and just try to roll in and out of them real quick, you know. Yep. yep. But, uh, but yeah, I, yeah, I think so, man. I mean, and have a buddy on call that's around just in case something sure. goes down. Yep. You know, have somebody camped out in Benavista or something. But yeah, I do I'm down. Let's uh, during next spring. Let's get together and go check some stuff out, man. Awesome. Well, it's been great talking to you, dude. I, I really appreciate yes, it. Yes, sir. Definitely stay in touch. And uh, yeah, man, do big things. <laughs> yeah, man. What I you're appreciate doing. it, buddy. Thanks yeah, for the time. Absolutely. Take care. Yes, sir. Thanks a lot. Yeah. We'll see you. Yeah. Th yeah. Right. Thank you too, man. Yes, sir. Bye. Bye.